Mr. Muhammad Ishad. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in last year's budget statement, Mr. Hing Sui Kat mentioned three major shifts in global trends. The shift in global economic weight towards Asia, rapid technological advancement, and changing demographic patterns. In this year's budget, he added a fourth trend, the decline in support for globalization and rising geopolitical uncertainty. Put together, the world we live in today is much more volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, WUKA for short. Adapting to a WUKA world, WUKA is a term developed by the U.S. Army War College at the end of the Cold War, but it has been most recently adopted by the millennial generation as a description of the unstable world that we are inheriting. The young are not unaware of the challenges that faces us today and in the future. In this WUKA world, we think about how much the nationalists and the anti-globalization trends will affect our economy in Singapore and in particularly our jobs. We worry about whether we can afford the increasing cost of living and supporting our elders and providing for our children. While we are familiar with technology, we also see how technological progress can overtake us in some of our jobs. And with technology, we also see how countries have taken to cyber warfare, where attacks can come silently and unpredictably. But we young Singaporeans also know that it is in our Singaporean DNA to adapt, overcome, and excel. I'm confident that we can strengthen our Singapore DNA to weather this WUKA world and prepare ourselves for the future. That is why it is heartening to see this year's budget address these challenges head on. Now allow me to focus on a few themes from this year's budget. Safeguarding Singapore. For a small state like Singapore, survival and success are two sides of the same coin. As Minister Heng said, Singapore is vulnerable to the fluctuations in our region and the world. Therefore, we cannot take our peace, prosperity and stability for granted as security threats are evolving and becoming more complex. I commend the move to incorporate digital defense as the sixth pillar of total defense and to establish the Home Team Science and Technology Agency. Cybersecurity has become as essential as physical security, if not more. I also commend the move to invest about 30% of our total expenditure to support defense, security and diplomacy effort, as it is paramount to safeguard the sovereignty of Singapore and the well-being of Singaporeans. Secondly, nurturing innovation through design thinking. Innovation is becoming a driving force in our economy and globally. In order to realize the vision of becoming a global Asia node of technology, innovation and enterprise, we have to continually reinvent ourselves to stay ahead of the curve. Singapore is ranked fifth in the world by the, Singapore, uh, by the Global Innovation Index 2018. But we can do more and we need to do more. Speaking at a ministerial forum at SUTD last year, PM Lee said, that good design thinking was a key reason for Singapore's successful journey from third world to first. And it will be critical in the country's future transformation for it to remain an outstanding city in the world. He further explained that design is a core element of Singapore's nation building. Increasingly, organizations in Singapore are seeing the value of design thinking and are starting to adopt it as part of their operational strategy. Global institutions like Design Thinkers Academy are also setting roots in Singapore to develop a fresh pool of design thinkers to cope with the increased demand for design, think design thinking professionals in these dynamic and trying times. The basic building blocks of a vibrant economy are strong, competitive companies that maximize value creation. Design thinking is not just a niche brand. It is critical that all our companies, especially SMEs, adopt this innovation strategy. The question is, how do we make sure design thinking and innovation becomes mainstream for all our companies? I would like to suggest the minister to explore incentivizing and incorporating design thinking as a core measure of success as we provide support to our companies across all programs and platforms. On transforming learning, 
I am heartened by this year's budget's focus on investing in our people, including young Singaporeans, to provide them with opportunities to gain working experience abroad. Our youth are ready to venture abroad and to gain valuable work experience and contribute back to our economy. The move to combine the current local and overseas internship programs into a single global tal ready talent program for students who are currently in IHLs is a step in the right direction. However, the global ready talent program alone is not enough. We have to also transform our institutes of higher learnings to prepare our youth to be ready for the future. One such program that does that is SMUX. Pioneered at Singapore Management University in 2015, SMUX is an experiential learning framework where, si where students tackle real-world challenges by taking on projects from corporates, non-profits, and government sector organizations both locally and internationally. SMUX has been lauded by the Global Accreditation Body, Association to Advance Collegiate Schools of Business, as an innovation that inspires. I strongly urge the Honorable Minister to look into expanding such programs across all IHLs to prepare our youth for the future workforce. Another area I would like to highlight in my speech is Workfare Income Supplement Program, which is a key pillar of our social security system to mitigate inequality in the working years. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Budget 2019 sets out to increase the qualifying income cap for the WIS program from the current $2,000 to $2,300 per month. It is said that low-wage workers receive annual WIS payouts of up to $4,000 based on Annex D1 from the budget statement. If you look at the 35 to 44 age group, the maximum annual WIS payout for employees is only $1,700 and $1,133 for self-employed persons. Furthermore, these individuals receive just 40% in cash with the remaining 60% going to the CPF. If you work out the monthly cash component, it is a mere $56.70 and $37.80 for employees and self-employed respectively. Let's take a case of a Singaporean turning 35 years of age and he is earning $2,300. After CPF contribution, he takes home $1,840 and even with the additional WIS top up, it will only add up to $1,896.70 monthly. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, given the rising cost of living, the financial burden on such an individual would be very high, especially if he or she has young children or elderly parents to support. Increasingly, I am seeing more young people entering the gig economy just to make ends meet, often taking on two or three jobs and scraping by monthly. Singapore's medium wage recently rose to $4,400. I would like to put forth three suggestions for the Minister to consider. First, increasing the WIS qualifying income cap to $2,640 to help our workers, which is 60% of our medium wage. And secondly, to lower the qualifying age to 30 years to include younger Singaporeans who are trying to settle down but are struggling to get by. Third, to increase the cash to CPF ratio to 50-50 or even 60-40. I hope the government considers this proposal and perhaps the inevitable GST hike can help offset the spending. Having said that the bicentennial budget is clearly has clearly signaled its commitment to build a caring and inclusive society. As a youth, I welcome the announcement of Merdeka Generation Package that is set to benefit about half a million Singaporeans covering the health care subsidies for life. I am sure it will go a long way in alleviating the burden of health care costs for elders and young adults who are taking care of their parents. I request the Honourable Minister to consider extending the package to all Singaporeans between the age 60 to 69 this year, irrespective of them having obtained citizenship by 1996. End of the day, they are Singaporeans and they have contributed to our nation over the years. Other slew of measures aimed at helping Singaporeans are also much appreciated. Tackling climate change. As part of government's commitment to address climate change and reduce, reduce emissions, and in line with Budget 2017 and Budget 2018 announcements, the Carbon Pricing Act 
and its, and, its, and its accompanying regulations came into operations on 1st January 2019. While the carbon tax will not apply directly to households, the implementation of such tax on industries will see a cascading effect on end consumers. Although the impact is expected to be minimal in the short term, any subsequent increase in the carbon tax rate may have a more significant impact on end consumers. Can the Honourable Minister share more on the cost and effects of the carbon tax in the long run? In conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, we often forget that Singapore is an artificial construct. It is a result of human effort and imagination as we mark the bicentennial year. We have to reflect on what has made Singapore succeed in the past and more critically, what would be important for its continued survival and success in the years to come. A national budget is a strategic plan to allocate resources across competing needs, be it defense, economic, human, social or environmental. Some of these needs are current, others evolve, involve investing for and securing the future. Minister Heng has struck a fine balance in addressing these varying demands with an eye on maintaining fiscal prudence. I believe this year's budget seeks to shape the country's competitiveness and continuing relevance in the world stage in times of increasing uncertainty. Mr. Speaker, with encouragement and optimism, I support the budget.